We're very happy to be here today hosting another session of our seminar series topics in early modern studies. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd first like, you, like to give you the house rules. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. After the presentation, we'll have time for questions. I'd ask you to either write your questions in the chat or use the raise your hand function to let us know that you'd like to speak, whichever you feel most comfortable with. When writing the chat, please feel free to make your questions in English, Portuguese, Spanish, or French. Finally, I'd also like to remind you that the session is being recorded and it will be, and it will be available on our YouTube channel later. Having that said, we're happy to welcome today Professor Luciana Villas-Boas. Professor Villas-Boas obtained her PhD in German Studies and Comparative Literature at the Columbia University. And since 2009, she is professor in the literature department of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. She has worked with the history of concepts and colonial literature and iconography. She is currently working on a project that deals with literary utopias and European colonialism, as well as a project about Goethe, Nietzsche and Hannah Arendt. Arendt. She is also the author of the upcoming book, the Republic in House Shoes, Bolsonaro and, Dis and the Dismantling of Representation, or in Portuguese, A República de Chinelos, Bolsonaro e o Desmonte da Representação, which is going to be out on the 22nd of January. Today, she will present a paper titled Utopian Encounters from Mo to Montaigne, which we're all very excited to hear. So thank you again, Professor Villas-Boas, for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Lydia Bernardes and Veronica Calsoni, for inviting me to participate in this series and for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share uh, my work. Um, since the spring of 2020, I've been working on Renaissance humanist utopias. Rather than retracing the history of the genre, I'm interested in the aptness of utopian fiction for debate. How did humanist scholars, artists, and printers engage with and redefine the reach of utopian fiction? I began to work on different sources, some consisting of utopian exercises, some comprising only responses to utopian fiction. Placed within their original context and communication circuits, these texts and images give insight into the specifically early modern outlook of utopian debate. In the first part of my talk, I wish to address a few distinctive features of early modern utopia, departing from a largely neglected topos, the fictive encounter between two worlds, the ancient and the new, the ancient and the old, that is, European world. These fictive encounters build a thread connecting Thomas More to Michel de Montaigne, Albrecht Dürer to Geoffroy Thury. A privileged, self-reflective instance of utopian fiction, they probe the applicability and historicity of the studia humanitatis, the study and reach of ancient sources. Let us begin with Thomas More. Just one second. Um, entire screen allow. Then I have to make this warning disappear. And um, Okay, um, I don't see you anymore, I just see my own PowerPoint, which is rather unfortunate, but there isn't much I can do. Okay, so there it is. Let us begin with Thomas More's paradoxical little book, published originally in Louvain in 1516. There you see the title page. And here the title. A truly golden handbook, no less beneficial than entertaining, concerning the best state of the Commonwealth and the new island, Utopia. 
Oops. A typographical invention in its own right, the book, as some of you may know, is divided in two parts. The first is a dialogue between Thomas More, here a character, and his interlocutor, Raphael Hisloday, the traveler and philosopher who had sojourned on the island of Utopia, and their common friend, Peter Dew. The second part of the book comprises More's retelling of what he had learned from Raphael about the institutions of the best state of a commonwealth. It is at the very end of the dialogue that we find Raphael, the utopian expert, uncovering the event that led up to the foundation of the utopian commonwealth. The utopians had heard nothing of men from beyond the Ecuador, that's their name for us, until we arrived, except that once, some 1200 years ago, a ship which a storm had blown towards Utopia was wrecked on their island. Some Romans and Egyptians were cast ashore and never departed. Now note that Utopians, the Utopians profited through their diligence from this one chance event. They learned every single useful art of the Roman Empire. What benefits from the mere fact that on a single occasion some Europeans landed there? If in the past a similar accident has brought any man here from their island, the incident has been completely forgotten, as our future generations will perhaps forget that I was ever, that I was ever there. From one such accident, they made themselves masters of all our useful inventions. But I suspect it will be a long time before we adopt any institutions of theirs which are better than ours. This readiness to learn is, I think, the really important reason for their being better governed and living more happily than we do, though we are no inferior than in brains or resources. Now notice that the utopians' encounter with the ancients is the encounter of the new world with the ancient world, or more, located the island in some area of the new world. Moreover, this fatidic encounter serves a specular function. While utopians were able to assimilate, quote, all useful Roman institutions, end of quote, from this one chance event, Europeans, real acquaintance with the ancients, hence with their own past, was ineffectual, as their hypothetical acquaintance with utopians would be. In contrast to utopians' readiness to learn, Europeans are not just forgetful, but oblivious, that is, unmindful. These encounters between worlds are as well encounters between historical times, indeed, fictions of futures past. How Europeans would have reacted to utopians, how Europeans could have reacted to rediscovering the ancients. These fictive encounters imply as well the reversal of the colonial experience. New world inhabitants, utopians, could perform the role of teaching their discoverers. Europeans, his day, the best form of government. The ancients actually replaced the Europeans as successful colonizers of the new world. The staging of a real encounter between the ancient and the new world, this inherently utopian expedient in the sense that it takes place in a no place, resurfaces in the essays Montaigne dedicated to the new world. In Moore's text, utopians become utopian because of their encounter with antiquity. In Montaigne's first essay of cannibals, the encounter between the ancient and the new world is articulated in the future conditional and amounts to a thought experiment. Montaigne predates the discovery of the new world in order to imagine how an ancient legislator Lycurgus and a philosopher, Plato, would have judged the savages. 
I'm sorry, Lycurgus and Plato had it not, had not. Oh, I'm sorry, this is um, this amazing copy of um, the essays. It is at the Newberry Library, here's the quote. In this wonderful translation by John Florio. Um, so I'll begin um, reading again. It is um, Montana, sorry that not ancient Greek uh, discovered um, the, the new world, but Europeans. I'm sorry Lycurgus and Plato had it not, had not discovered the new world. For um, it seemed, I'll, I'll read in modern English, it seems to me that uh, what in those nations we see by experience does not only exceed all the pictures wherewith licentious poesy has proudly embellished the golden age and all her quaint inventions to feign a happy condition of man, but also the conception and desire of philosophy. So the new world exceeds all that. They could not imagine a genuine genuity so pure and simple as we see it by experience nor ever believe our society might be maintained with so little art and human condemnation. Then Montaigne goes on performing an imaginary dialogue, answering and objecting to what he thinks Plato uh, uh, would, would uh, say. So he's imagining Plato's perplexity and, and um, engaging a conversation with him. It is a nation, would I answer Plato, that hath no kind of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no intelligence of numbers, no name of magistrate, no nor of politics superiority, no ruler, <laughs> no use of service, of riches, of poverty, nor contracts, no successions, no partitions, no occupation but idle, no respect of kindred but common, no apparel, clothing, but the natural, no manuring of lands, no use of wine, corn or metal. The very words that import lying, falsehood, treason, dissimulations, covetousness, envy, detraction and pardon were never heard amongst them. How dissonant would he find his imaginary commonwealth from this perfection? If they had the Greek ancient Greek had discovered the new world, societies from experience, I'm sorry, if they had discovered the new world societies from experience, Plato and Lycurgus, that is the ancient wise, in Montaigne's word, man that um, were, could, man that better than we could have judged, would have questioned their view of a golden age and the perfect republic, their philosophical longing, that is, their standards of human happiness. In short, they would, unlike Montaigne's contemporaries, have been re-educated by New World inhabitants. Indeed, as I, ha as I have argued elsewhere, like Moore's praise of Utopia, a no place, Montaigne's praise of cannibals takes the form of the so-called paradoxical encomium, a rhetorical jest which involves the praise of unworthy, unexpected or trifling objects in order to allow for the reversal of perspectives and the creation of an open intellectual space. It suffices to recall um, It suffices to recall the utopian ending of Montaigne's essay to understand the reach of this rhetorical exercise. Two Pinamba travelers are received by the French king and invited to share their perceptions of the French society. After turning France into a terra incognita, the French into natives, and the Tupinamba into ethnographers, Montaigne dryly remarks, in anticipation of his reader's parochialism, I quote, all that is not very ill, but what of that? They wear no kind of breeches, no hosen, 
end of quote. So in another skeptical reversal of perspectives. In Montaigne's uh, second essay uh, about the new world of coaches, um, he unfolds the fiction of the ancients as discoverers of the new world and imagines the stakes of an alternative colonization. Why did not so glorious a conquest happen under Alexander or during the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans? Or why befell not so great a change of and alteration of empires and people under such hands as would gently have polished, reformed and incivilized, which means civilized, what in them they deemed to be barbarous and rude? Or would have nourished and fostered those good seeds which nature had there brought forth, adding not only to the manuring of their grounds and ornaments of their cities such arts as we had, and that no further than them, and that no further than had been necessary for them, but there was all joining unto the original virtues of the country those of the ancient Grecians and Romans. So joining, it would have been a convergence of ancient um, Greek and Roman virtues and New World virtues. The hypothetical colonization of the New World by the ancients bears on the given reality of Montaigne's time in a twofold way, as a mirror and a contrast. The view of a virtuous alternative colonization of the New World is a diagnosis that serves to characterize the present. In Of Coaches, Montaigne spells, spells this specular contrasting function out. Whereas contrary-wise, we have made use of their ignorance and in inexperience to draw them more easily into treason, fraud, luxury, avarice, and all manner of inhumanity and cruelty by the example of our life and pattern of our customs. Whoever raised the service of merchandise and benefit or traffic to so high a rate, so many goodly cities ransacked and raged, so many nations destroyed and made desolate, so infinite millions of harmless people of all sexes, states and ages massacred, ravaged and put to the sword. And the richest, the fairest and the best part of the world topsy-turned, ruined and defaced for the traffic of pearls and pepper. O mechanical victories, O base conquest. It almost sounds like Shakespeare because it sounds like Shakespeare and floral and um, is definitely present in Shakespeare's um, um, world and place. Never did greedy revenge, public wrongs or general enmity so moodily enrage and so passionately incense man against man under so horrible hostilities, bloody dissipation and miserable calamities. The fiction of a civil encounter with the new world is but an instance of what could be, not of what should be. It is the articulation of a sensible possibility against historical contingent factuality. This observation bears on the fictionality of the utopian exercise in the 16th century. To approach the status of utopian fiction, let us take another quick look at the original edition of Moore's book. Here is the map and a sample of the utopian language. Um, here it is. Yes. Um, you see the map and the alphabet and epigrams. Um, 
um, the, the alphabet and the language that the uh, what is written underneath is clearly related to Greek and Latin, but rendered in stilted Latin, and therefore here in this the translation I will read stilted. Oh, I don't have the translation here. Stilted English. Uh, Eutokos it was. So here is um, this little poem um, with, um, on the bottom of the right page. Um, and I will uh, read it in, in English, of course. So it is, um, as you will see, it is the island. It is Utopia speaking. Utopus it was who read, redrew the map and made me an island instead of a cape. Alone among nations resplendent I stand, making virtues as, pla as plain as the back of your hand, displaying to all without argumentation the shape of a true philosophical nation. Profusely to all my own store I give, what is shown me that's better, I gladly receive. So this is an allusion to the fact that it is the best state of the Commonwealth, not the best Commonwealth. The speaker here is Utopia. The island republic tells us that she was made into an island, artificially separated from the continent, literally cut off from what was already given the 1518 Basel edition not only hints at the artificial separation of the island from the continent, but also shows Hitler Day, the utopian expert, pointing to the island and engaged in a conversation with a scholar. Um, this is uh, by Johann Froben, this, this edition. So Froben's title page introduces not only the fictional insularity of Moore's book, it also introduces the circumstance that utopia originates from within a dialogue, from the juxtaposition of different points of view regarding applicability of utopian knowledge. Moore books recognizes by virtue of its division into a dialogue between humanist scholars and the utopian report proper, that utopia is debatable. The notion of arguing both sides in Utranke partis defines not only the structure of the book, but also its language. The utopian expert's name, Raphael Hitler Day, Raphael meaning God's messenger and Hitler Day specialist in trifles nonsense is but one example of how serio ludere to play seriously entails the notion of arguing both sides. In the essay on vanity, Montaigne makes an explicit observation on utopias. He writes, quote, all those imaginary artificial descriptions of the government are ridiculous and unfit to put into practice. However, End of quote. However, while denouncing the futility and the vanity of normative utopias, Montaigne tersely remarks that they are suitable, quote, for our quarrels and intellectual exercises. So Montaigne uh, clearly embraces the fictionality of utopia as an intellectual practice with a vocation for debate. Modern utopias were designed as a model of a political organization that should and would be empirically established in the future. Early modern utopias, from Moore to Montaigne, were declared fictions of what could be. They were not the normative or moral anticipation of history, but possibilities conjured up against the mere contingent factuality of history, and therefore fit for quarrel and debate. Now, in the second part of my talk, I wish to unfold my argument on the meaning of early modern utopia and examine in more detail how embrace of fiction 
coincides with the renunciation of feasibility, the withdrawal of action for the aptness for dialogue. And um, so I turn to the short history of a utopian image, an image of rule that results from the fashioning of an ancient figure for a European public. Okay. It's also, as you will see, uh, closely related to um, an ancient source. So, <clears throat> if one had to define early modern conceptions of rule, monarchs in all their magnificence and expanding authority would most likely spring to mind. One would conjure up the crown, the scepter, and the orb together with other regalia or attributes of royal power to usher the imaginary and truly real presence of the monarch. The image I wish to focus attention on is at odds with the outlook of early modern sovereignty. As I will show, the humanist view of an eloquent ruler problematizes the traditional aristocratic model of power and its location in the body politic. Humanist artists, printers, and scholars collaborated closely to produce and circulate the image of an unlikely figure, the so-called Gallic Hercules, a Hercules who rules by words, not force. The image originated from the reception of a prologue by Lucian of Samosata, a second century Greek author writing during the High Roman Empire and most fashionable in the so-called Lucianic circles of the early Renaissance. In this text, Lucian discovers an image showing that the ancient Gauls, unlike the Greek, identified not Hermes, but Hercules with eloquence. And I quote um, from Lucian, that old Heracles of theirs drags after him a great crowd of men who are all teethered by ears. Yet, though led by bonds so weak, the men do not think of escaping, as they easily could, and they do not pull back at all or brace their feet and lean in the opposite direction to that in which he's leading them. In general, we, the Gauls speaking, um, consider um, Heracles uh, a wise man who achieved everything by eloquence and applied persuasion as his principal force. There's something truncated. This is um, um, from a different passage in which a, a Gaul explains to Lucian, who is um, the traveler and narrator of this story, um, why uh, Hercules and not Hermes um, is um, the embodiment of persuasion. Now, the earliest graphic representation of the Gallic Hercules is a delicate watercolored pen drawing made by Albrecht Dürer around 1514. The drawing shows an aerial figure moving swiftly forward through a band of clouds driven by wings fastened to his shoes and helmet. The fleet-footed messenger with a Mercury star above his helmet is designated in the inscription as Hermes. Besides the inscription, much of the speaker's figure invites the beholder to view him as Hermes or its Roman counterpart, Mercury. However, the drawing also deviates from conventional images of the Hermes Mercury motif. Dürer's drawing is in fact a commentary on Lucian's text in its own right. While rejecting the Gauls association of Hercules with eloquence and reconnecting eloquence with Hermes in a sort of uh, Grecophile typical gesture, Dürer incorporates Lucian's delicate chain-like tongue as a visual token of the power of eloquence. 
Dumas' drawing eventually shaped the iconography of the Gallic Hercules precisely by making the relationship between the speaker and his audience visible and, there, and thereby reflecting upon the very aim of ancient rhetoric, the capacity to move and conduct others through speech. As Crassus, Cicero's mouthpiece states, mm -hmm. the highest goal of oratory is, I quote, to get hold of assemblies of men, win their goodwill, drag their inclinations wherever the speaker wishes, or divert them from whatever he wishes, end of quote. Does Dürer's orator bring and hold men together? In Lucian's text, the ruling orator produces an undivided public, joined by consensus. In Dürer's drawing, the public is divided by virtue of both rank and response. While the female figure plays a mediating role, the public and the speaker seem to inhabit different realms. The listener's historical outlook and division contrast with the abstract and mercurial speaker positioned above real space and time. What are the implications of this discrepancy? There is an aspect of the drawing we have not yet paid attention and that discloses either a dynamics of attending to eloquent words. It is, to be sure, a humanist dynamic. For who else but the backward scholar, um, maybe you see it to uh, the left. Um, he turns his back towards us, the beholder. So um, who else but the backward scholar is trying to direct the aristocrats in full armor. Um, so he's trying to uh, direct the aristocrats' attention to the speaker. The scholar is admonishing gesture directed to the knight encapsulates the difference between a humanist and a chivalrous response to the gentle pull of words. The common citizen follows from a greater distance and with relative indifference. Only the light-footed woman surrenders to the pull of eloquence. The church is conspicuously absent from the audience. The scholar's gesture is key to the picture's meaning. Pointing to the direction in which persuasion is leading the public, the scholar's hand gesture reproduces that of the antique woman and Hermes himself. Together, the three oratorical hands form an ascending diagonal along with the picture's moving figures. Finally, by portraying the scholar with his back turned to the beholder, Dürer makes the viewer approach the scene from a humanist, scholarly perspective. At first sight, Dürer's image seems premised on the disjunction between an ideal Hermes and a real public. Upon closer inspection, the scholar's hand gesture reaches beyond this compositional frame by exposing a gap between the appeal of eloquent, eloquent rule and the strictures of social hierarchy. Dürer's fictive personification of rule, of rule by eloquence, touches explicitly on the historical and political contradictions of his time. All images of the Gallic Hercules produced in the aftermath of Dürer reflect on eloquent rule by exploring the reaction of a crowd of listeners held together by the Herculean tongue. Um, Yes. Um, let us glimpse at two um, title page illustrations that incorporate all the attributes listed by Lucian's um, Gallic Hercules. In your of Dürer's view of eloquence as a floating, expeditious speaker, eloquence now embodies a heavy, earthbound ruler. The speaker carries arms and a bow and a club and holds a thick thread running from his mouth to drag followers along. This image shows the speaker holding a large, 
somewhat tumultuous crowd with a pull of his heavy tongue. While he stands still, the crowd pushes forward in his direction. Overlapping with the robust tongue, a strong bow and an arrow pointed in its direction. What is this conflation of force and persuasion? It certainly sheds doubt on the nature of Hercules' power over the crowd. Is it the force of words, persuasion, or the threat of the arrow, fear? This other image clearly took the previous as a model, yet also made a few crucial adjustments. Hercules now holds the arch, not the string and the bow, and moves in the, in the same direction to that in which he leads his crowd. Moreover, the position of Hercules' tongue has changed. Instead of piercing the ears of his listeners, it drags them by their shoulders. Insofar as his, insofar as his heavy-handed chain does not command understanding, but rather seizes bodies, Hercules' power rests not on persuasion, but on force. In addition to changing the nature of Hercules' power, the picture denies its efficacy. The crowd does not yield to the application of force. An elderly man in a miniaturized and specular version of Hercules stamps himself against the Herculean pull. While the image seems to contradict the power of persuasion, it is also directly inspired by Lucian. And I quote, Yet, though led by bonds so weak, the men do not think of escaping, as they easily could, and they do not pull at all or brace their feet and lean in the opposite direction to that in which he's leading them. End of quote. While in the woodcut we see, by contrast, Hercules's application of force. <coughs> I'm sorry. Against the background of Lucian's text and ancient tradition in general, the image appears to contradict both the power of persuasion and its irresistible efficacy. But if we recognize that the image implies a double inversion, force replaces persuasion, resistance, irresistibility, we can also read it as a witty, paradoxical corroboration of rule by persuasion. If the crowd resists not the delicate, irresistible bonds of rule by persuasion, but to the heavy, resistible pull of rule by force, then the image affirms ex negativo the power of persuasion by stating that force is resistible. Thus, the claim that persuasion is irresistible is not denied, but affirmed through negation. Remarkably, the images that compared, um, that I have compared with Dürer historicize the Gallic Hercules, drawing him closer to the social world. And as they do so, they render his capacity to rule by speech alone problematic, even ridiculous. How the humanist ideals of eloquence, civility, and prudence embodied in the Gallic Hercules contrasted with the chivalrous ideals of strength, fortitude, and bravery of the aristocracy is evident in this image of Maximilian I on horseback. Seen in the context of the ruling nobility, identified with chivalrous rather than humanist values, the comic, even grotesque aspect of a Herculean ruler trying and failing to use his tongue was, within humanist circles, certainly worth a laugh. These images, I think, all subscribe in a certain way to the Hercules in words as a preferable model of rule. But they do so by portraying its actual implementation as ambivalent, problematic, even ludicrous. Their approval of the idea by indirect and negative means entails a critique of rule by force. 
this critique does not mount an attack against a concrete authority in the present, it remains couched in ancient references and typology. It is not an open statement against established hierarchy, but a dissimulated and generic condemnation of rule by force. The appearance of these um, Gallic Hercules images as illustrations on the title page of um, huge um, editorial projects. Um, one is uh, Lorenzo Valla and the other, um, an edition of John Chrysostom. Um, shows that their visual humor was addressed to and shared by the broad public of the so-called Republic of Letters. In the hands of French humanists, the Gallic Hercules served a different and clearly programmatic purpose. It generated the disconcerting image of a nude orator king that was directed against the traditional, that is, medieval, robed king with crown and scepter. Objects indicating that kingship actually dependent dependent on non-royal, ecclesiastical, and juridical agents. In the nude orator king, disrobed and disarmed, the makeup of royal authority rather than the outcome of divine grace was the result of personal, natural, or acquired virtues. There are two critical moments in this programmatic disrobing and disarming of the king. The first is Geoffroy Thury's Jean Fleury, published in 1529, which comprised Erasmus' Latin translation of Lucian and the first transla translation into the vernacular by Thury himself. Thury, humanist scholar, printer, and engraver, produced an image of Lucian's Hercules aimed at redefining French kingship. There you see it. Dürer's imprint is easily recognizable, the binding tongue holding the body politic together, as well as the public divided by rank, that is, estates, and by response. One part of the audience vividly and attentively approaches the speaker, the other stands removed and immobile. The aristocrat in full garment listens from a greater distance, the scholar in his gravity and stillness contrasts with the liveliness of the crowd. Another striking feature is the proximity of the orator king and his subjects, and um, the compositional arrangement placing the heads nearly on one horizontal line. In addition to that, there is a closeness to the king that were at the heart of popular ways of encountering the king en route to their entry, but certainly not in traditional official royal images. This compositional aspect, with its particular view of the body politic, would become apparent in the use of Thury's image at Henry II's entry ceremony in 1549 in Paris. Here's, um, According to one of the illustrated reports, the image, the image that you see, which I took from this illustrated report, um, the image was placed on the triumphal arch of Box Saint Denis. The gate kings would pass in the return to Paris, um, usually from religious service. Two giant um, rustics hold uh, silver crescents with Henry's device. The ship, it's too small, it's at the very center of the, the, the picture. The ship the emblem of Paris is placed at the center. And in the upper level, two nudes uphold a cartouche, a kind of, that looks like a scroll, um, right um, below uh, the king's feet, uh, where the plateau, so to speak, is. Um, with an inscription which is absent from the woodcut but present in the description. Um, this inscription glosses the scene shown above, and I quote, we are pulled and we freely follow, end of quote. 
The traditional public representation of the King of France consisted of a crowned figure wearing royal robes. In 1549, as Parisian humanists turn to royal nudity, they remove authority from ecclesiastical sanction and establish instead the model of the orator king whose tongue brings and holds people together. While sculptural classic heroic nudity had stood alone or with allegories, the nude Francis I, Gallic Hercules, is surrounded by personifications of the four states, clergy, nobility, the parliament or council, and labor. What are the naked king and his costumed subjects doing up there? They communicate. Like tableau vivant, all the states raise their hands to appeal to Francis and to signal how they react to his appeal. It is the people's voice that sanctions the political constitution of the state. As the legend says, we are pulled and we follow willingly. Finally, the performative dimension of the image being displayed at the entry ceremony should not be forgotten. Henry II, the Roi Soldat, on horseback, would look up to the image unfolding on the monumental arch. Francis I, Gallic Hercules, surrounded by the states, would look down on his son to show him the ways to exercise royal authority. A Machiavellian moment, the prince being asked to confirm, to act out the image that his subjects the many make of him. Let me try to wrap up. We could say that the humanist Francis Hercules embodies a new kind of power based not on arms or religion, but eloquence. But is the orator king a sovereign? Certainly not an absolute, but a relative authority whose power needs to be reenacted. It is the outcome not only of decision, but of speech and action. Hence, the orator king is not an embodiment of power, but rather part of a relation, a relation that joins both ruler and ruled in a reciprocally meaningful space. This humanist view of the nature and medium of power resists embodiment and emphasizes the mediating space of the tongue. Humanists disarming and disrobing of the king, if not a withdrawal from sovereignty, were certainly a pull towards civility. Clearly, Geoffroy Thury's image of Francis I as Gallic Hercules in the book and at the Paris royal entry is not just a utopian visualization of a possibility, but the concrete anticipation of an ancient ideal. Unlike his German counterparts, Thury historically incorporates the Hercules in words. But although some came to believe the Gallic Hercules was indeed the historical founder of French monarchy, the nude orator king placed on top of Saint-Denis gate is not only fabricated, but also at odds with religious traditional setting. So this brings me to my final remarks. Thury's nude orator king contrasts with Dürer's insipid drawing, Moore's utopian commonwealth, or Montaigne's noble conquest, in that it is not only an intellectual play tailored for debate, but a figure displaced at an entry meant to teach the king. But there are as well commonalities between the utopian exercises articulated in the medium of print and the French humanist image of kingship, of kingship performed on the streets. They all wither traditional foundations of power, both natural or theological. They're all human fabrications and recognize the fictive and secular nature of power. Here lies the modernity of all these humanist interventions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. 
Thank you very much, Professor. I think Veronica, you, Veronica's sir. connection yeah. failed. <laughs> I just had an issue here, but everything is, <laughs> is okay right now. Thank you, Professor, for such a fascinating talk. It was uh, really brilliant, and I guess that everyone uh, might have a question. So uh, we are opening the floor for questions right now. If you wish to uh, pose a question or a commentary, please use the raise hand function or uh, the chat box if it it's more uh, if it's easier for you to do so. Andre, please. Are you listening to me now? Okay. Thank you very much um, for the series, Livia and Veronica, and in particular, thank you very much, Luciana, for your brilliant talk. Um, if you allow me, I don't have one question, but three very small ones, since I was fascinated with your talk. <laughs> so you don't have to take so much notes because some of them are really easy to answer, or I'd like to know how you came up with interesting results. The first one, I'll come back to the section on Montaigne in your interest on the reversal of the colonial experience. Mm -hmm. And you use such an interesting copy of Montaigne's work, but we just had a glimpse on this copy. It was really a bit of one second. And um, I would ask if you could show us a little bit more about this copy. And perhaps I'm interested to know if you were interested in um, um, understanding how far 16th century pens and quills and readers were engaged with this the, the, the reversal of the colonial experience. I mean, um, how far did they take notes about such a uh, reversal of the colonial experience uh, in a similar perspective as you were working with? The second question that I have um, is about this image that you are uh, very interesting that you've shown from the first one. I'll come back to the Dürer. And as, a, as far as I know, some of the, draw, uh, the drawings of Dürer, it, it was very interesting because you, saw, you, you brought up a drawing, not a print, not a cut. Mm -hmm. And some of his drawings date back to a collection of drawings. For instance, the collection of drawings from Schiele, and something like that. So um, how far is important for you to come back to a kind of orange of an ancient typology or something like that? Do you deal with um, such a methodological, um, I would say, interest in coming back or searching for origins of such typologies that you've been working with? And the third very... Uh, Short question, uh, it's about a print, a cut from Turi, uh, 1529, but the mm -hmm. woodcut dates 1526. Do, do you know um, what's going on in those three years and what about the history of this print connecting text and image? I'm confused about Turi. What did I do? I, there is the book, Jean the Fleury. Books, you painted 1529. And, and what cut, did I do next? The cut is dated 1526. That so, is wrong. Uh, it, it's wrong. So I was curious about dating, just about the chronology of this message. What is 20? At the very bottom. Um, this is 29. It's this 29. is... Um, Yes. So perhaps I, I. Saw and this is, yeah, this is, I can't, I, I didn't do it myself because I'm, I, I, I lack the skills. But I, I used um, Gallica. It's online, Jean Fleury, and it's wonderful, and you can do a lot with it. And this year is probably a, as well. It's been a while that I. I uh, got hold of these images, but this year is also easier to get in reproductions. This is more complicated. Are you saying, oh, you're not seeing my screen, right? So I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm showing the images to you. Hang on. Um, 
that is too bad. It's easier to show the image than trying. Not for nothing, they are images and not text, so I shouldn't um, try to. Can you can you share my screen now? I mean, can I share my screen? But now I um, just one second. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the image. It's not this one, Luciana. It's a cup. Uh, two or yeah, three. Yeah, it's four. it's from Jean Fleury. This is an imitation. This was inspired by Fleury. Mm -hmm. And what you're asking me about is this here. If it's too right. bad. I don't. I have. I have the complete thing I could show you, but it will take. Oh, yes, you're you're referring to the date here, right? That's it. Oh, um, so this I don't I, know. I don't know. I there there is something about it. I have. I can check it for you if you want. But if what it I can was tell used you before or uh, because it's three years. So that could be. Um, and and certainly it circulated a lot because um, it's part of this reception of Lucian's text and the circle of Italian, German and French translators and and the reception of Lucian begins much earlier in Italy and and then in Northern Europe. So it could well be that Turi, who decides in this book to reproduce Erasmus translation into Latin, and who, who also provides a translation, the very first translation of the story into French, that um, this image was circulating before. But the more complicated thing and there's very little evidence actually showing the transmission is this image here, which is, of course, a reproduction of what was shown at the entry. Um, but you asked me something. So this question I cannot fully answer. And so I'll move to your second question on Dürer. And and uh, the book, you're right. This is a, a this is a drawing. It is in a book at Vienna, and it circulated through copies greatly all over Europe. And I couldn't get hold of the whole book itself, but only a variety of reproductions. Um, and then you also asked me if I work according to a given um, method to read images, some kind of iconography? Yes and no. I, I resort to different um, analysis and I'm, I'm rather bored when it comes to only, although I do it too, I mean, where does this helmet come from? There is There are all the sources of other fellow humanists with whom uh, Dürer was in touch in Nuremberg and you know how uh, vivid an, an, an exchange he was um, having. But um, then what I don't like is these works dedicated to showing that uh, Dürer corrected Lukian or that he disagreed with Lukian. Um, I, I, I tend, I prefer to read, and I'm sure he was aware, he was part of these Lucianic circles um, by virtue of his uh, uh, closest friendships. For instance, Willibald Pirkheimer, who is one of the uh, translators of Lucian and was very close with Dürer. So he's not, uh, uh, he didn't get Lucian wrong or was ignorant of the ancient sources. I, I tend to believe that they deliberately 
uh, altered it. He engaged a conscious dialogue with that ancient sources and his gesture is a typical kind of Grecophile gesture. No, this is, you know, the right Greek version of the myth. But beyond that, he's also trying to actually um, translate this figure of persuasion to a European public. And he does this in, in, in a rather surprising way, a very uh, insiferate way, because one needs to look very closely to notice that the scholar, the humanist scholar is teaching that Rita figure, how to, who's completely oblivious of the situation, to look at, <laughs> to react to the pool of words. So it is an insider joke. There is a lot of visual humor going on in the image. It's actually my favorite image. Uh, perhaps I should write only about that image, truly. <laughs> but then there is this whole um, transmission and, and this whole fortune of how Dürer represented this in-between space, this uh, rule by eloquence with, that, with a chain tongue. And yeah. And then the first is the most difficult um, question because um, I think I have two answers. The first is no, not a lot of people were of Montaigne's mind, but certainly many humanists were um, very critical of, of colonization. And um, this is one answer. The second answer is that the justification of conquest was um, more controversial than today we tend to believe at large. Um, yes, I, I think these are the two contests. Uh, there is, I try to follow exactly this um, fictive encounter and its relation with fictive encounter between the ancient and the new world. Um, departing from Thomas More, Montaigne and then Shakespeare and, and contextualize these three moments uh, within the broader history of European expansion. So mm, More was really indifferent <laughs> to colonization, though he would, um, um, he's uh, trying to do something that is um, the opposite of everything that was uh, being printed about the new world and had uh, uh, no um, real engagement with the new world. This is different in the case of Montaigne, obviously, and, 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 and then Shakespeare is uh, really um, a pessimist vis-a-vis uh, -vis colonization. Um, I'm not sure I, I somehow uh, answered your question, yes? Okay. Well, we can continue talking about that. And I will get you that information on to the, I want to know to myself. Well, I think I think Veronica's computer has gone off again, so I will allow myself to ask the next question, if that's okay, Professor. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about. Um, I found really interesting how you approached the colonialist aspect in Moore's Utopia, um, especially when it came to the to the encounter between the Europeans and and the natives of the island of Utopia. Um, I admit that I never thought about the matter in, in this way. Um, would you would you mind expanding a little bit more on that, please? You mean how the utopians became utopian? Yeah, it's usually a, a forgotten um, little passage, right? But it's right there, not in the dialogue. It's actually in the in the letter to Peter Gilles, and and. Um, so more is um, is remembering what 
no, I'm wrong. I'm conf it's, I'm confused. It's at, at the end of of um, the the dialogue. This passage, and it's um, and Hitler Day is actually answering a question by Peter Gilles, and and then he comes up with this past event that is at the origin of uh, the utopian Commonwealth, and clearly it it takes a specular. <laughs> function because it shows that uh, queers utopians learned from this one chance event and were able to assimilate all the best Roman institutions. The Egyptians there are really uh, stand for the inventors of mathematics and philosophy than uh, his day. So it's ancient wisdom. And uh, so um, they were able to assimilate all the best Roman institutions. Whereas um, if some utopian was shipwrecked on the old, in the old world, on our shores, Hitler Day says, nothing would happen. And, and, uh, and even that I was ever there will soon be forgotten, Hitler Day says. So there's this obvious um, humorous and serious contrast between the capacity to learn, the readiness to learn, the applicability of studia humanitatis in the utopian world and the European world. Um, and of course one could also connect this with the beginning of 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 um, the new world as as the space um, of um, as the privileged imaginary territory of utopian societies. Um, but I think um, there is a slightly different um, meaning to to it to the new world. Uh, in in more in Thomas More's little book, so there's this specular function, and of course um, uh, diagnostic as well. Um, it shows how um, oblivious and and resistant to learning Europeans are, and it's obviously they're poking fun on on the whole um, subject matter. I mean, what's um, is there a place for a philosophy at court? Will ever kings um, listen to our to our advice? Are they uh, are we ever going to educate the nobility and so on? Thank you. You're very welcome. They, your microphone's not working. Um, Phil, would you like to ask the next question? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to ask a question about um, humour and wit. It struck me that um, you could have had a title for your paper, kind of humour and um, humorist advice to government um, in the 16th century. And if you could maybe talk a bit more about that element of the kind of humorist discourses that you're interested in, but also I guess more specifically, um, whether there's any kind of similarity or difference between Montaigne's wit and Moore's, given everything that's gone between 1580 and um, uh, 1516. Um, Montaigne is obviously living in a very serious time, um, a difficult time. I'm, I'm just wondering how the kind of the humorous aspects of the humanist um, uh, mission kind of survives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there is a huge difference. I would, I would claim. Um, yes, I. But before I, I, I compare uh, more and and Montaigne, and and um, just one uh, small comment. Yes, it is about humor and wit and this um, rhetoric of doubt and paradox um, that humanist cultivated. But I was also interested in, in their political imaginary and in their conceptions of power 
and and um, how this comes up through these fictive encounters, because uh, they all these encounters um, imagine uh, different. Uh, there is a different political uh, possibility that is being discussed. As to the differences, well, Moore was at some point more optimistic. And actually, I think this comes across in this um, uh, small passage that um, Livia commented on the passage in which uh, utopians are ready to learn. <laughs> and there is this amazing efficacy of, of Studia Humanitatis. I don't think uh, uh, Montaigne shared that ever. And, um, um, and I'm thinking of, of an essay I adore on, on, online, in which at some point he says, and this is an echo of the Gallic Hercules and this um, sort of um, um, ancient ideal, republican ideal of rule. Montaigne says, but he's despairing. He says, we have but words. We are only humans. But instead, we're all killing each other. Um, yeah, but then um, Montaigne's humor is a, is a long, is a, is a broad field. So I think this perhaps answers uh, your question partly. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Can you listen to me right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I had so many uh, technical issues here today, but um, I in in invite anyone to ask another question if uh, you want to. But while you are um, thinking about it, I have a question myself and I was trying to type it if I had no possibilities of asking myself, but uh, I was very intrigued uh, during your talk, uh, Professor, while you were presenting um, the pictures on Hercules Gallicus um, and the idea of the, the um, chain that was actually um, containing the people by force and not by persuasion. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking uh, on the possibility of resistance, not just the resistance um, against force, but also in, in terms of persuasion. If um, How do you think that this uh, relates to or where does this lies within the humanist rhetorics or dialectics or the discussions on um, the good government or the possibility of resistance or the right to resist? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The right to resist. This sounds very contemporary. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, but it's great. I mean, I don't think, I mean, we are where we are, right? And, and should be aware of the distance, should ask whatever questions we want to become aware of the distance that separates us from the past. So I, I like this kind of question. There is more dissent than I expected, but then dissent, but then at the same time, they truly hope for consent, these humanists. So um, it's, they do not welcome dissent the way we do. But this brings me back to Philip's uh, observation about wit. A way of dealing with dissent is as uh, through this serio luderis, through this um, 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 playing seriously diction, very Lucianic, um, and, and um, that is truly a kind of insider, um, um, uh, is meant to to um, to circulate within certain um, certain publics. Um, what I'm trying to say is that um, when things change drastically, and before Moore dies, he writes in a letter to someone I forgot who it is, 
that if he could, he would collect all the copies of his books and burn them to avoid that they, that they get to the wrong hands and that they are misinterpreted. So this is an indirect way of answering your question. And, and, and now I think that uh, um, the, the, the question of uh, the, the rhetorical uh, dimension, this uh, rhetoric of doubt and paradox, this aptness for debate, this notion of arguing both sides, at least two sides, often more, um, is um, 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 it's not well. It's so. It's not just humor, not just wit. It's it's a, a, a serious. It, it's something we will never recuperate. I mean, we couldn't do that in 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 in, uh, in the public realm. Use this kind of serio ludere distinction. This wouldn't work. And um, the difficulty still is when we interpret more and Erasmus and this early generation of, of Renaissance humanists is that we, uh, instead of choosing just one tradition, say the Lucianic tradition, and then they said Ludere, there's this beautiful essay written by Ginsburg. Um, we choose either Lucian or Cicero, that we deal with both. <laughs> And I think that in order to understand what Moore and, and, and Erasmus and, and, and so many others are doing with this particular code is um, uh, we need to take these two different traditions um, into consideration, not just one. Thank you very so much. not just Skinner and not only Ginsburg, but we need to to yeah. meet Cicero and and Luciano and um, clearly both are present in, in the little book. <laughs> yeah, thank not you. Just one of them. Um, any other questions? So uh, because of the time, I think that we might um, finish the session today. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Luciana Villas Boas once again for accepting our invitation and also for giving this fascinating uh, lecture that I am sure that everyone learned a lot. And uh, I would also love to invite you to attend next session, which will be next week and not in two weeks. So uh, we are going to receive Dr. Lorenza Gianfrancesco uh, on the 26th of October this change in our uh, schedules because of all the bank holidays. So we had to make some um, adjustments, but everyone's invited to join us again next week. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Professor, once again, and see you next week then. <laughs>